Yes, thank you. Welcome everyone to another installment of the ISCAP seminar series. Uh, this is a series on the historical tropes in contemporary anti-Semitism. Uh, this series brings out the perennial patterns and the phenomenon of anti-Semitism to shed light on the matter of why exactly it, it is the longest hatred. Uh, the aim of the series is, first of all, to elucidate the millennial themes and variations on those themes that bring out the essence of anti-Semitism. Uh, the purpose also is to expose and explain why the phenomenon is at once ancient and modern. Third, the aim is to impart a deeper understanding of how what was once the scandal of anti-Semitism morphs into a fashionable anti-Semitism. And fourth, uh, the, the purpose is to enable participants in the seminar to recognize the phenomenon in all of its subtle manifestations and to seek ways of responding to it. Themes to be examined throughout the series uh, that, are, that have been and will be or, uh, include the anti-Semitic appropriation of truth, uh, things like the blood libel, blood purity, the drive for redemption or salvation, the invisible and ubiquitous evil ascribed to the Jews, and, and more. The series brings out the implications of theological and ideological tropes of anti-Semitism, both historical and contemporary. In the end, the series will situate contemporary anti-Semitism within the eternal context of ethical demands and imperatives. It will pose the ethical questions that implicate each of us with regard to this phenomenon as we encounter the phenomenon. The question comes to us that was put to the first human being, the firstborn of the first human being, where's your brother and what have you done? Today, we, we are honored to, to welcome uh, Dr. Grant Keane, uh, as our speaker today, Dr. Keene is a professor of communication and gra graduate program director at California State University, East Bay. He studies new digital media effects from a critical cultural perspective. He has conducted research in seven countries, published more than 20 scholarly journal papers, and authored several books. He has been an invited plenary speaker at universities and conferences throughout North America, as, as well as in places as far away as Moscow. Dr. Keene's current research focuses on the characteristics and consequences of mimetic communication and analyzing fascistic discourse on social media. Recent publications include the full-length book, Communicating with Memes, Consequences in Post-Truth Civilization, and the journal article, Mo uh, Postmodernism Trumps All, The World Without Facts. Please join me to welcome Dr. Grant Keane. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to join this series. Uh, my work will definitely focus on the more contemporary aspects of anti-Semitism. And uh, I will just launch right into it. So um, I will begin actually with some definitions to, uh, to justify the longest title in the world. Um, all of these words actually together do mean something. It's not just a jumble. Um, so I'll begin with the definition of the alt-right and the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, describes the alt-right as a set of far-right ideologies, groups, and individuals whose core belief is that white identity is under attack by multicultural forces using political correctness and social justice to undermine white people and their civilization. And the second uh, line here is actually the, uh, the key that this is characterized by heavy use of social media and online memes. The Nazi robot troll army takes a little more explanation. This is an army of white supremacists controlling botnets directed by specifically Andrew Anglin, 
to target, harass, confuse, shut down civil discourse, spread misinformation, and instigate hate. To understand what all of this means, uh, we have to unpack a couple other terms here. A bot is an automated app programmed to quickly do repetitive tasks that imitate or replace a human user's behavior. So it's a little piece of code that just does the same thing over and over once you give it the command to start doing it. Um, bots constitute more than 50% of internet traffic. And at one point it was estimated that 55% of Donald Trump's followers on Twitter were bots. And, and uh, that was how he was able to shoot out his uh, messages so effectively. A malicious bot is a type of bot that scrapes content, spreads spam, carries out credential stuffing. It just keeps putting in uh, information and uh, denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks and brute force password cracking. And a botnet then uh, are copies of bots that run secretly on a lot of devices throughout the internet and use the IP addresses of those of those devices and it makes it difficult to identify and block the source when there is a malicious bot attack. Um, this includes things like smart home thermostats or even your router. Um, anywhere that is connected to the web is a potential place where a, um, a bot can be hidden and the botnet then expanded. Um, a troll is a person who intentionally instigates conflict, hostility, and arguments online with their inflammatory messages. And the goal is to provoke emotional responses, disrupt discourse, and create confusion and fear. So that is in some uh, what the Nazi robot troll army is about. And an aesthetic assault is, in this case anyway, the deployment of offensive and hateful images in botnet attacks. Um, and this works through what I'm calling the virtual aesthetic economy. This is the circulation of images through social media networks as a form of social capital, which gets guided by the logic of use value for the people who are consuming it in social media. So there's a logic that um, guides their interaction with this content based on how they want to be perceived and how they want to put themselves out there in social media. Um, social capital, if you're not familiar with the term, was, uh, it comes from Bourdieu. Um, this is the acquired skills, knowledge, experiences, and positions that elicit social status from other people. And the value of social capital is contingent on the specific group that you might be interacting in. So that can change from one group to another. And then there's the issue of power. Power in social media in particular manifests in struggles for aesthetic dominance. 21st century politics and social justice are struggles over appearances that have real world consequences. So the virtual realm itself is a simulacrum. That's Baudrillard's uh, concept that I'm referring to there. And uh, it's a simulacrum fixated on clever aesthetics rather than facts and truth. So people value clever aesthetics rather than the integrity of, of uh, truth and facts. The political struggle then in this postmodern, post-truth world seeks to recreate what Paul Virilio called the optically correct, things that look right to people. In social media, the optically correct is a subjective and interpretive act of self-branding. We choose for ourselves what we decide is optically correct, what we want to see. So aesthetic dominance is decentralized, generated through the use of value, of value of signifiers to individuals towards their image self-management. And we in social media are our own editors. And this is one of the things that's fundamentally different about um, the way we consume media now. We no longer have the same gatekeepers that we once had. So um, this has changed the game in terms of managing content on a mass level. Um, specific meanings can be suggested, but they can't be enforced. So 
run through a little bit of history about anti-Semites online here. Um, there's no question that anti-Semites have been present since the origins of the internet. Um, there have been uh, organized Nazis and white supremacists online since the 80s. Stormfront in particular, they, they were called something else in the 80s, but uh, they rebranded in the 90s. Um, the KKK, the ANP, others like that have been online since the be very beginning. Um, and there have always been casual, um, casual anti-Semitism mentioned in online discourses, which led to Mike Godwin's creation of the Godwin's Law counter meme response, um, where uh, the, the principle there is that the longer a uh, discussion goes on, the more likely it is to reference Hitler or Nazis. Um, and uh, these, these anti-Semites online have appropriated activist tools to gain significant control over the virtual world. They have taken control of or, or learned the tools that activists developed, in particular anti-globalization activists uh, from the 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, a lot of these tools were developed with a very different intention and use, but uh, they've definitely been appropriated and in some cases perfected. Um, so anti-Semites online have evolved with the technology to current extremes, which include things like live streaming massacres and other hate crimes and the revival of visible KKK and other hate groups, which focus on the spectacle of these, um, of these occurrences. So some of the key actors uh, include Stormfront, which is the neo-Nazi online forum that I mentioned earlier. It has facilitated hate speech since the 80s and was renamed Stormfront in the 90s. And as Bayrich put it, they have 30 years of encouraging white supremacy. This, um, this group was actually shut down domestically in 2017 after 100 people um, were identified uh, as having been murdered by people with Stormfront accounts. Um, as is the, the way things work online though, they simply moved, they moved their server and they continue to operate offshore. They have well over 300,000 user accounts. And then the Daily Stormer. And this is the entity that, um, that I was mentioning earlier, controlled by Andrew Anglin. Um, the Daily Stormer has been the largest white supremacist web presence since 2017. It has gone through some turbulent times uh, through the court system. In fact, uh, Anglin was um, prosecuted and found liable for a, a large settlement to a family, uh, but he went into hiding. Nobody knows where he exactly is right now. So um, after being gifted some Bitcoin, he uh, disappeared and he continues to run the Daily Stormer from um, elsewhere. Uh, this was uh, the, um, the, the main um, control center of the, of the Stormer Troll Army, as it's called, um, which he helped foment online, encouraged uh, other users on, of his site to band together. And he would then lead alt-right online harassment campaigns from there. So the Stormer Troll Army targets Jewish individuals, organizations, and people perceived to be liberal sympathizers. And uh, he has targeted uh, murders, uh, genocide, armed preparation for a planned race war. And uh, so he's part of what is called accelerationism. Um, and at this point, there are more than 30 chapters of this uh, Daily Stormer in the physical world. So it has gone from the online presence to the physical world. And here's just a smattering of the usual suspects, I suppose, um, just to show that they are all um, healthy in their online environment. Um, so, we also find a lot of anti-Semites in mainstream social media. And uh, the, the nature of social media is that you won't see them if you're not interested in it. 
uh, because your preferences, your browsing history, your email and so on does not reflect an interest in it. So you generally don't um, get connected with that kind of content. However, if you are interested in that, anybody who wants it will start being fed a lot of these, um, these streams, uh, or at least links to um, streams that'll lead you to it. So uh, Twitter has been the most rampant social media used to promote hate. Um, YouTube has hidden channels with, with anti-Semites and live streaming of various uh, types of content that would be uh, include things like um, the QAnon group. Um, Facebook also has hidden groups and live streaming. You could probably tune in and find a QAnon discussion right now. Um, TikTok, uh, Reddit, Telegram, Discord, Twitch, these are just the main ones that you might think of off the top of your head, but uh, of course there are many more. Point being that mainstream social media uh, facilitates the presence of these, uh, these types of groups, and um, they can be very hard to find once they're there. So there's also the contemporary anti-Semites in new and fringe social media. I've mentioned QAnon, um, 4chan, and 8chan. These are, these are a specific type of image board um, that uh, fomented the QAnon phenomenon, and they have been used also to live stream um, acts of uh, terrorism. Um, there have been many um, messages ongoing that uh, include things like manifestos. So uh, these are some of the more recent, um, I guess, online developments that are used. Uh, and um, some of the groups that have come out of this are the Proud Boys, which most of us will probably have heard of at this point. They were founded in 2016. And even though they've denied that they're um, anti-Semitic, they uh, kind of clearly are, uh, if you examine their um, apparel here. Um, there's the Boogaloo Boys, which have made an impact with their uh, Hawaii shirts. And uh, they were established in 2012 on 4chan but uh, really been more public since 2019. Um, I think that uh, these, these quotes from TechStream actually are quite apt when it comes to their place in uh, the virtual anti-Semitism realm. So law enforcement and policymakers should consider that terrorism inspired by social media has evolved from lone wolf threat actors to a meme-based insurgency that can coalesce in a short time period. And the Boogaloo movement operates online through memes and in jokes. So what this means is that crowdsourced groups of individuals who otherwise likely wouldn't connect and know one another um, can actually form and coordinate in real time smart mobs, what Howard Rheingold called smart mobs. Um, and they are also crowdfunded. So this gives a whole new platform to these groups to both gather together, find membership, and to find funding for their activities. And in addition to this, as the mainstream web starts to root out some of these elements, the uh, alt-right has been forming its own web. So there is an alternative version to pretty much every platform. Um, and here's just a short list to, um, to reflect that. Altogether though, what, has, uh, what is happening here is that the armaments or the medium and the ammunition, which I'm calling the content here, have changed in recent history. The messages themselves have remained constant. So images and messages themselves are deployed like germ, warf germ warfare canisters. They're meant to be pushed out and go viral. And anti-Semitic tropes and misinformation memes thrive in this environment. So synagogue shootings and other acts of terrorism get designed as virtual media events, serving up physical world tragedy as spectacles. 
we see these things like online manifestos, live streaming, real-time commentary, and the effect is normalization of fascism in everyday life by taking virtual, um, the virtual into physical performativity. Social media then is used to revive old tropes for new audiences. And uh, these are just a few headlines, but if you start digging, you'll find many more. The tactics of the Nazi troll army are in essence an extreme form of cyberbullying and harassment. And uh, this is what Stantonian called the weaponization of moral panic. The method is to assault people with huge waves of denigrating spam, trumped up public outrage, personal threats, and then retreat from the virtual sphere is the only recourse that people have because you cannot uh, withstand that kind of virtual assault. This creates a climate of fear and thinking twice before posting controversial facts and stories. So a de facto attack on democratic principles of civic engagement through public discourse is what happens. And this silences oppositional voices. The ubiquity of our social media means that there are more potential targets and points of contact for harassment. They can reach people who otherwise they wouldn't be able to. Um, it is also harder for victims to escape because social media is everywhere we look. And there are large readily available audiences for harassment campaigns, which um, wouldn't be available outside of social media. So their method then is target specific persons or organizations and then deploy content through botnets to induce an online mob mentality. There's often no discoverable or visible leadership in these attacks and the perpetrators protect, are protected by anonymity. And there's a kind of absence of organizational and individual liability as a result. It can be difficult, if not impossible, to assign responsibility for all of this destruction. And the goal of these attacks is to insert anti-Semitism into various discourses wherever they can, to dominate the narratives with normalized tropes and stereotypes. And once it's out there, there's no way to undo the damage that's been done. As uh, Sturgis put it, there is a level of permanence that is not evident in traditional bullying. These things, once they're deployed, once they're out there, they, they can't simply be deleted. So the Nazi troll army's aesthetic assault consists of an army of cyber bullies controlling many more armies of virtual robots that target individuals and organizations with numerous tactics at the same time. This creates a giant wave of harassment which hits suddenly and overwhelmingly and then it becomes impossible for the victim to do anything at all online or for an organization to raise its voice in response. But in all of this, there's a danger in mistaking these weapons and the strategy for the problem. To defend from the attacks is necessary, but that does not root out the threat. And uh, what's different, what allows this to continue is that there's a different nature of the text and the user's experience of consuming it than with traditional media. This moves the aesthetic struggle beyond what Bruno Latour called the iconoclash. There's a speed and absence of loyalty to images that, um, that is different from iconoclash. It's not a simple uh, struggle over the meaning of, of icons. It's rather a, a, a disloyal, churning of the images. And everyone in social media is an iconoclast, the destroyer of images. We constantly re reassign meaning with these uh, uh, memes. We add our own little bit to it and uh, or else we, we alter it in some way. And um, that becomes the destruction of the original symbol. From a semiotic perspective, there's an absence of a fixed signified, something that the signifier is referencing or a representum um, in Barth's language. 
there's also a plurality of audiences, that there are numerous anti-Semitisms in virtual space. There's not just, I mean, it's experienced as one, obviously, but there are numerous anti-Semitisms constructed in virtual space. The narratives are, are plural. Um, so there are numerous splintered and scattered audience communities and anti-Semitism itself doesn't concern the vast majority of users in one regard or another. So it can be ignored easily when it crosses through a social media news feed, uh, if it even reaches um, specific people at all. And awareness then can be very difficult to raise, concern even harder and actual change elusive. An example of this would be that the extent of a user's engagement with an issue may be simply choosing not to share or forward a post um, or not like it. They simply scroll through it. And uh, that may be the, the, the limit of their engagement. And engagement with issues is very, very difficult. That's the, um, that's the, the gold standard for advertisers, of course. They want to engage people. Um, there's also a difference in the power of mass media combined with viral distribution being put in the hands of malevolent individuals, which produces a direct flow from anti-Semitic agents and the robots to individuals. Um, this is possible through social media because, as I mentioned earlier, the traditional gatekeepers uh, of, of our um, Old, old world media are not there anymore. So the flow comes from the alt-right and online Nazis to other male malevolent individuals. And then it gets pushed from there to unaware media consumers who perpetuate hate propaganda, and they may not even recognize it as that. There's also a difference in the nature and the functional aspects of discourse communities. Discourse analysis reveals the ideology in various communities. And I've actually had students doing research on this for the past five years, um, studying fascism in social media. Um, and one of the findings is that uh, symbolic convergence plus narrative paradigm explain how these um, discourse communities are formed and how they unite. So, with symbolic convergence theory, Borman's theory explains that groups unite around their own story and they defend their myth from outsiders. And people bind together in groups through narratives that they tell each other about the group. And this creates a shared consciousness rooted in the version of reality that the narrative has constructed. So when a fantasy trope is well known, a short symbolic cue is enough to call the narrative to mind. And these are things we see in dog whistles, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's also a shared consciousness constructed and then the rhetorical vision that sustains it. The validity on the other hand, the, the uh, justification um, is conducted through narrative paradigm and Validity is judged according to how well it fits with the rest of the story being told. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It has to fit the narrative. Um, in order for people to accept new information, it must make sense within the sum total of all the stories people have shared with each other about the world and be consistent within itself. So Fisher called this narrative coherence and fidelity. So as long as it kind of hangs with the rest of what they already believe about themselves and the world, then they will accept it. If it does not, then it will be taken as an attack on their own um, symbolic convergence and they will defend against it. Um, Foucault's work can help understand how communities like this police and defend their discourses and insulate themselves from outside influence. Anti-vaxxing is a good example of this, which started online in the 1990s and has developed to the point now where uh, the community's grown that we now have a smallpox threat again in this world. Um, but also anti-vaxxing, particularly with the uh, advent of COVID-19 has an anti-Semitic contingent, which considers vaccinations a Jewish plot. And here's a little smattering of 
of that. Um, but this, uh, this character um, over here in front of the virus is uh, particularly ubiquitous now. And uh, I'm gonna use the, what's what they call the merchant or the anti-Semitic meme of the Jew as a case study in a minute to demonstrate something. So what's happening is that mimetic communication reanimates old tropes in new aesthetics and platforms. And the strategies to build botnets arm themselves with content that's um, created and appropriated from different places online, um, altered and made into uh, Nazi symbolism or anti-Semitic symbolism, and then deploy it within their own online communities, which gets pushed to the mainstream and extended personal networks. Um, it can be done through targeting specific users like the Cambridge Analytica MAGA campaign did uh, to unite the uh, Trump supporters. Um, it can be done through social media viral distribution, through spamming, trolling, attacking, just get that image out there and it will continue to perpetuate. And then there's also the insinuation through hipster racism, which I call the South Park problem that anti-Semitism gets disguised as humor. So not every, uh, not every image or not every meme has to um, explode, but uh, if they keep pushing enough out there, some will. So the first step is creation of the graphic itself. Then there's the deployment and the normalization of the graphic. And this was done with the merchant as a two-step campaign. There was an entry on knowyourmeme.com where they titled it The Merchant and explained this was supposed to be a joke just for fun. So there's the hipster racism. And then a Facebook group called The Merchant was made in 2014, providing false history of the meme, claiming it was created as fun and it was pushed out through there. And then the next step is the cross-platform and physical world reproduction. So Stormfront recirculated the image, Reddit groups and 4chan and other groups picked it up and forwarded it and the image leapt into the physical world. And um, this anti-Semitic meme of the Jew has reappeared in many, many formats at this point. We also have the dog whistles that I mentioned previously that will um, indicate that someone is a white supremacist or someone is Jewish to people who are in the know about these symbols. And uh, we also have the normalization of the outrageous. Nothing seems to be shocking anymore. Nothing's off limits. Um, and the prolonged engagement in virtual environments makes everything and anything seem possible with uh, little or no comparison with physical reality. And this reflects what Gerbner's cultivation theory called mean world syndrome. Um, the motivation for audiences is experiential, not informational. So anti-Semitism has become mainstreamed again. And uh, we see this uh, reflected in statistics all over the world. Here's a French study that um, was looking at the rise of anti-Semitism online during the pandemic from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Um, the global scale is part of the problem. And uh, this is difficult because if, if someone is shut down in one place, they simply pop up in another. Uh, right now, Epic out of Seattle is a popular platform for, um, for uh, alt-right groups. So external policing only moves intersections of power. And the problem exceeds and traverses the domains of a given technology. So reactionary technology and policy solutions alone won't be sufficient. There needs to be a more active approach. And this is also reflected in best practices to combat anti-Semitism on social media from the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism. So there've been some well-meaning but insufficient responses and um, to 
uh, end things on a more positive note, there are things that can be done about it. Um, our defenses would include things like stop treating the virtual space as if it's separate from the rest of the world. Don't deflect policy and tech company accountability. Take virtual anti-Semitism seriously. Focus on the sources while contending with the shots they take. Support the organizations working against online hate. Recognize the global nature of the problem and participate in the aesthetic economy. And that is the, a crucial one to participate in the aesthetic economy. Do not simply scroll past everything that you don't like. Engagement is key. So I did break this down a little more with a little more detail, um, but that's the essence of what I wanted to get across today. Um, and I think uh, if you have any questions or comments, this is now the time to bring them up. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, yes, if, if you have questions, please post that in the chat or there is also a Q&A tab you can click. I actually have a question myself. <laughs> uh, do you find if, when, or ever the what you describe with the Stormfront, the Stormer, KKK, and the, uh, the other the alt right social media, do you do they ever intersect or, or converge with uh, things like Nation of Islam or BDS or Islamic Republic of Iran or? Uh, you know, uh, jihadist uh, activity? Do they, or, or they remain completely separate from each other? Um, they're, they're also a target from, of the alt-right. So um, it's not, I, I think there's typically uh, some agreement with certain tropes, but, uh, but in, in the uh, bigger picture, they're perceived as an enemy. Yeah, interesting. Well, I'm, some of the uh, memes or images, icons, or uh, I'm sure, and, and I mean, I've seen appear on both kinds of sites, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they do. I mean, they they circulate. Yeah. 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 They they jump across platforms, and that's the that's the uh, mimetic nature of these. Uh, images and the, this kind of content is that it gets altered. So the origin um, doesn't matter after a certain point. It could be pushed out by, um, let's say, Stormfront or, or uh, Daily Stormer, and uh, then it can be um, circulated through a more mainstream uh, Facebook page, mm -hmm. for example, and someone on that page doesn't necessarily recognize the origin as being a white supremacist. Um, they may forward it themselves or they may uh, tag it or alter it. And then it can cross platforms and cross audiences into a whole different realm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we have a question from Richard Robertson. Uh, Mr. Robertson asks, are the communications in the United States, which are anti-Semitic, being nationalized or justified using nationalist sentiments with enhanced frequency? Um, I don't know about enhanced frequency. Um, the, the adaptation that's happening is interesting because I... Uh, the, the Daily Stormer, for example, um, the images I used of their banners in uh, the slideshow are older banners. Their new one is just a plain text banner. It doesn't have uh, much indication at all of its violent nature. So they're rebranding. And the Proud Boys uh, is another group that has been softening their public image trying to make themselves look like they're um, more inclusive and meanwhile continuing to pump out this kind of rhetoric. So um, I don't know if I would say that the sentiments are, are, are coming out with enhanced frequency. I think maybe uh, they're, they're reaching a broader audience. It might be a different way to, to put it um, because they, 
they've always been putting the stuff out there. What's different now is that uh, people who are inclined to receive this kind of um, message in their social media are more likely to get it now. Other questions? No. Well, um, then I'll I'll keep talking. We'll keep talking. Okay. <laughs> um, the you 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 indicated that for for most of us we don't notice it because we're not looking for it. Are they? Uh, do, you, do you find that they're preaching to the choir, or are they being? Are they successfully recruiting? Uh, Oh yes, they're successfully the recruiting. Yeah, they they definitely are successful at what they're doing. Um, the uh, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting uh, time in terms of our global media because um, we really have become our own gatekeepers, and uh, it's easy to 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 not see what you don't want to in your media. Um, so it's, it's really, as a result of that, also hard to know exactly how much is being spread to, to who. Um, plus, there's the clever hipster racism side of this, where um, it's dressed up as humor. And um, you can have people who are sarcastically consuming this content, and they know it's a joke, or they take it as a joke. But meanwhile, you also have the people who are consuming this as a as a sincere message. And you, how do we how do we parse these audiences out? It's it's really impossible to know what people are thinking. Yeah, yeah. Does that address your question? Yes, yeah. uh, yes. Um, you know, is the P in ISGAP stands for policy. You know, it's the institute for the study of global anti-Semitism and policy. And we went wherever we can, and we do this, I mean, if you know the, the work of Charles Small, um, we try to make known to policymakers what we find, what we turn mm -hmm. up. Like, for example, like what you've turned up. Uh, do you find that the, the, the alt-right anti-Semitism ha has an impact on policymakers or are they were they i mean i assume they would like uh, yeah, i think they would i i i haven't i think it's more of a of a of a common hate speech issue and not anti-semitism in particular um it includes misogyny and um mm -hmm. other forms of racism um but Part of the problem also is that part, you know, there's a huge element of of people in the system who are consuming this kind of um, this kind of content. So we end up with uh, lawmakers participating in things like the January sixth assault on the Capitol, and uh, you know these these folks are in government, so. Um, they may not yeah. particularly see this as a problem. What about, um, you know, the, the Nazis were uh, actually very highly educated. That many of them had doctorate degrees. Dr. Goebbels, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Mengele, uh, the, you know, nine of the 14 men at the Bonsai Conference had doctorate degrees. Um, Highly educated. Mm -hmm. Are the, do you find my, my impression is that you don't have people with doctorate degrees in this crowd, or do you? Well, uh, that's yeah. Actually, it's to in one on one hand, it doesn't matter because it's about the technology, not about the um, you know the broader education. Um, so as long as someone knows how to use the technology and code a little bit, um, a lot of folks can participate in this, but there is also a huge, uh, contingent that 
is participating either ironically and sarcastically or not, um, that is part of the Silicon Valley crowd. And uh, the, um, um, for example, there's this, this huge kind of, they, they call them tech bros around here. I don't know if that word is used mm -hmm. outside of this area, but say uh, the, a part of that, there's a, a contingent in that culture of tech bros that um, espouse uh, kind of, I don't, I don't know how, it's a, like a corrupted form of libertarianism. Um, and uh, so they're just as likely to participate in this type of, um, this type of work as, as anybody. Um, so I, I don't know if we can really break it down in terms of education the same way that it was once possible. Uh -huh. And these are, these really are the gatekeepers of the, of the platform design. Yeah. So they, they are highly sophisticated. In yeah. Many, yeah. And, Some are. and trained and skilled, right? They, yeah. they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and when we look at uh, the image board, uh, 8chan in particular, um, you know, those are, those are, sophisticated coders they know yeah. how the how to keep things anonymous how to keep things secure for themselves um and uh, their their participation in this has been well documented yeah i'm i'm actually curious i haven't made a connection yet but the uh the main funder of uh 8chan and uh, the the um the uh I guess the instigation or the, the, the continuation of the uh, QAnon groups, uh, that conspiracy uh, relocated to Seattle from the Philippines where he's actually from. Um, and I, uh, sorry, he's from Seattle, not the Philippines. So he's, he's back in Seattle and uh, not, I, I don't know if it's just coincidence, but that's where this uh, new platform that's hosting a lot of alt-right um, presences online has sprung up so i don't know why seattle uh if that's just coincidence or if there's something <laughs> <laughs> but there is a huge tech community in seattle yeah 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 um you know one of one of the uh, statements made by alfred rosenberg a nazi ideologue who was um executed in 1946 as a war criminal. He, he, Rosenberg stated and elaborated that, uh, that what is poisoning the Aryan spirit and mind, the Geist, is not just Jewish blood, but Judaism. I mean, the contagion is the Talmud and the Torah. Do you, do you find this or um, it's, when you say that they're more about incitement than providing facts and information. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems to me that they don't go, they, they can't go very deep into Jewish religious teachings, traditions. I mean, what exactly is the danger posed by the Jew? That's a, you know, that's always the, everything. <laughs> There's nothing no. off limits. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question because uh, it's it's hard to pin down, right? It's an elusive uh, scapegoating, and uh, any issue gets turned towards um, the the anti-Semitic explanation. And I I'm not I don't know if it's purely an ideological or the, or a reference to genetics or you know it it doesn't seem to really matter. In, this, in the memes, because what's more important to the survival of a meme is that people find it useful for their own self-branding. So if an image is put out there, like for example, the, the um, anti-Semitic meme of the Jew, um, that's a cartoon-like character that people can use for a number of different um, statements. And it contains both the spiritual and the um, genetic 
tropes? Yes, um, I think once, one, one thing that you bring to light, you know, with great insight and depth is the implications of the meme, which I'm, I'm not sure we've even yet thought that through as much as we might. Um, but the meme is no no one has ever seen a Jew who looks like the Jew in the meme. No. <laughs> right. So it's 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 a it's it's the Jew gets placed in a mythical or metaphysical category, right? And as you say, <clears throat> um, it's not that there's a shift here in anti-Semitic thinking from all Jews are evil to all evil is Jewish. Mm-hmm. Right. If you want to purge the world of evil or corruption or contagion, COVID, you know, get rid of the Jew. Mm -hmm. if it's I, evil, I, I can see how that argument would be made. Yeah. Yeah. That there's a, a displacement of all, um, all things that are bad onto this mythical figure. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the Hamas charter says that it, the, the Jews are behind every war that's taking place. Yeah. Uh, and that sounds like something that could come out of one of these websites, right? Oh, it does. Yeah, it does. It's that that's one of the tropes regularly circulated. Now, all of the, the most stereotypical tropes, you know, the Jews control the media um, and the financial system and... Yeah, right. It, it, there's no end to it. Um, and I think what Richard here is saying is that no different from historical portrayals of Jews yeah. from the Middle Ages through the... Yeah, it's, it's not really um, much different in my assessment, but it's, uh, it's the scale, the, the scale at which and the speed at which this is done. Mm -hmm. And it, it does not um, allow a reply. It's, you can't keep up with right. it. Yeah. And as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tiny minority of the Earth's population, when you get that much um, momentum going in the, in the greater global media system, um, it's, it's just overwhelming. How, we, how do you stop this? Well, I don't know if you really can. Like, as I was saying, the problem exceeds policy. It exceeds the ability of, uh, of a company like Facebook to um, do much about it. And I think Zuckerberg has taken a lot of heat for this. Um, but it's also, he's also being scapegoated for this. Even, yeah. if, even if Facebook, and Facebook is policing content more than they were, at least in America, I don't know what the rest of the world, but I, um, they'll just move somewhere else. It's not going to get rid of the, this, this culture of anti-Semitism. Well, you just made another, yet another, uh, I think, extremely important point, namely that it doesn't allow for a reply. There's no possibility of response. There's no exit. Uh, so you, you turned, you turned over to a kind of, uh, paralyzed vulnerability that you <laughs> um well and the, and the effect of it though of this system is that a lot of people don't even realize that that they are boxed in that way yeah 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 which yeah. you do all the more important well it's a, it's it's pretty much every issue as well, this exceeds the this problem exceeds anti-Semitism. It's sure. part of the reason we have such a polarized political system in the U.S. And uh, you know the the um, the information that gets put out to counter this other information can simply exist alongside of it. It it doesn't displace anything. It just adds to the jumble of information that's out there. And uh, there's, as, as I mentioned, there's a level of permanence to this. Once something gets deployed into our global system, you can't delete it. And, no, and, and it's, there's no place for discussion or debate. No. <laughs> or, or engagement. No. 
or dialogue or dialogue. Yeah, there's no dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because it, the communities that are sharing these uh, these this type of content, it just they're insular. They won't dialogue. And in fact, a lot of people who mean well um, won't dialogue either. You know, the ex as I was saying, the extent of their engagement with the content will simply be scrolling past it rather than engaging with it. Because we're so inundated with content and the mm -hmm. way that our news feeds and, and uh, apps are designed, if we just simply scroll in an endless kind of stream, mm -hmm. um, giving ourselves this dopamine rush whenever we find something new and we engage with it this way. We just keep streaming through without really engaging with any one thing. So again, once again, you hit on something that really strikes the core. It really opens up an insight. Uh, namely, it's, it's not only that we, it, it's like we want to be anesthetized, you know, the dopamine rush. We don't want to think, analyze, which is too much trouble and too difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want the rush. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Our that, motivation for consuming social media is not information. It's, it's that experience of the, of being bathed yeah. in it. Yeah. This is all very scary to me, Dr. King. <laughs> I've heard Thank that you before. for scaring, <laughs> scaring the daylights out. No, I mean, this is very important. Yeah. Um, well, what's to me, what is the biggest problem is that it's not really understood this way by even most people who are trying to do something about it. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's the hardest part because I it requires a different way of thinking about social media and what we're doing with social media as individuals. And uh, I'm not, I, I always say, you know, I've been teaching this stuff for, for years now. Um, I always tell my students, you know, I'm no different. I'm no different. I do the same thing that everyone else is doing online. Um, and you know, you're no different. This is how it's designed to be consumed. And we like it that way. And uh, <laughs> we like the things that it gives us. <laughs> I like that my phone knows where I want to go next. Well, so I don't like have our, to pull up my map on my own. <laughs> we, like, we like our drugs too, but, <clears throat> you know, that's... Uh, but, and as you say, the thing, it's not being aware of, <clears throat> of, of, of what you're doing or what you're being hit with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, there, and therefore, you, there, there is no responding to it if you don't know <laughs> what's coming at you, right? Yes. Yes. You don't know it, it's there. You don't know it exists. You don't know your enemy is right beside you or someone with, with malintent is right there. Wow. <clears throat> wow. But they're invisible to you because you're fixated on keeping your world uh, mm -hmm. in Fisher's narrative paradigm. You know, you want to keep your narrative um, coherent. And so you don't let in other information that, that mm -hmm. would contradict it. Well, that, that doesn't leave much room for truth because truth is undermining. Yeah. Yeah. Truth can be very uncomfortable. And yeah. That's the last thing any social media company wants you to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is all exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, and that's, that's another, another aspect. I, I do tell my students, if you're not a little bit uncomfortable, you're not learning. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Huh. It takes some discomfort. It takes some, some determination to, to discover and to learn about truth and to understand what facts actually are well dr king you've helped us today uh we, we're, we're we're at the end of our time uh, this has been engaging eye-opening uh needful 
And I, I know certainly for me, extremely helpful. And uh, I mean, I study this, these things a lot myself in other, in other ways, history, philosophy, and so on. But, and, but I know nothing about social media, but man, have you opened my eyes in many ways and I'm grateful to you and, and, and I'm sure we all are. So uh, with that, let me wish you a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone uh, tuned in. This uh, will be, uh, has, has been recorded. So uh, if you have friends who would like to see it, uh, you can go to isgap.org and find the recording there pretty soon. I'm not sure, it, very soon, very soon it'll be up. So with that, thank you. Uh, goodbye.